the things that are true. You receive the word with all ranks of mind. You search the scripture daily where those things were so. And when you found it to be so, you gird up the point of your mind that you hold in the truth. You have a stabilized mind. You have a sober mind or a sound mind. And you'll see again in verse 13, he says, be sober. That means keep out the pollutants. You know those things that would pollute your mind. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The things that come in from the outside. The things that are trying to entice you and draw you away and get your mind on other things. Can I say sometimes it's the sorrows of life. Sometimes it's the uh, sad things of life. Sometimes it's the situation of life that get your mind polluted and off of uh, being sober. And then it says a sight-filled mind. And he deals with the revelation of uh, Jesus Christ in verse 13. Is that not what he says? And, uh, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto the, you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I said there's two areas of that. And that it means to have our, our, our focus fixed looking unto Jesus and looking for Jesus. And then we're looking unto Jesus and for Jesus and His spectacular coming when He comes in the clouds. And He says, come up hither and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we will turn alive and make sure we caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and there shall we ever be with the Lord. I like thinking about that day. Hallelujah. I'm looking for the day when He comes in His glory and that splendor and that spectacular coming. And I think about that spectacular coming when we're looking for Jesus. But not only do we look for Jesus in His spectacular coming, but in His situational coming. In the midst of our situations where He enters into the midst of that situation and is there with us. Those three young Hebrew men were thrown into the fiery furnace. And when Neb uh, looked over, you know, Neb, Neb, Neb he's Nebuchadnezzar. We just call him Neb for short, hallelujah. But old Neb looks down there and he said, I saw four men in the fire and one that appeared to be like the Son of God. Hallelujah. I'm glad that the Son of God will show up in our situation. And I'm looking for him to reveal himself in our situation. Paul said, the Lord is at hand. I am glad for those situations. When the Lord just shows up in the midst of our situations, we ought to have a sight-filled mind looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then we ought to have a submissive mind, verse 14, as obedient children. As obedient children. It is means not just looking for Christ, but yielding to Christ. Obedience. Obedience. Not passing yourselves according to form of lust in your ignorance. Yield it unto Him. Yield yourself unto God as those that are alive and dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And so we find that you need to have a consecrated mind. And if you have a desire to have a consecrated life, you have a consecrated mind, you'll have a consecrated memory. And we dealt with that. And that consecrated memory, uh, some things to remember is our condition before we had, before Christ. Before, we we'll remember when you had a, we're living a depraved life. Your heart being deceived above all things, you'll see uh, right there in verse number 17. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons, Judges every man, or judges according to every man's works. He said, Pass the time you're sojourning here with fear. I'm talking about He judges according to our works. If He was to judge you according to your works, how would you be judged? He would find you guilty. He'd find me guilty. He'd find us sinful sinners. Oh, in me that is in my flesh, what is no good thing? And if there's nothing good about me, and I've got a heart that's deceived above all things and desperately wicked, what are my works going to be? Will all my righteousness will be as filthy rags? Will all the faiths leaving our iniquities like the wind have taken us away? There's none that do with good, no, not one. I am glad I'm not being judged according to my works, but I'm glad I'm being judged according to the work of righteousness that was done on the cross of Calvary when Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed me from all sin by that precious blood. Hallelujah. 
Remember our condition before Christ. Depraved. And not only depraved, but dying. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. Oh, it's going to die. The grass withered, and the flower thereof falleth away. That's verse number 24. Now I know that you and I were spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. But can I say, we're going to also die. You were depraved. Because your spirit was dead and your soul, the soul that sinned, it shall die. We found ourselves in that condition before Christ. But can I say, He quickened my spirit. Hallelujah. He redeemed my soul from destruction. Amen. He's going to give me a glorified body one day. He's got all three parts covered. He's got the spirit covered by, by regeneration. He's got the soul covered uh, by redemption. And he's got my, and my, my body covered by going to give me a new body. Amen. So we find a consecrated memory of our condition before Christ. And then we think of remember the cost paid by Christ. Do you remember how much he paid? The cost paid. Was, our condition was pitiful and the cost was priceless or very pricey. Let me say that. It cost him everything. It cost him a lot. It, it was a precious cost. The precious blood of Christ, he says in verse number 18 and verse number 19. Do you think about the value of the blood of Christ? Precious, precious, precious. But not only was it a precious cost, a precious price, but it was a planned cost, a planned price. You'll see the word there in verse number 20, a barely foreordained. That means to be absolutely a plan. Absolutely foreordained. He said barely, I say, this is going to happen. It was planned. What God plans, God does. Now it might be through wicked hands who crucified the Lord of glory, but it was the plan, of, the plan of God from the before the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ would die for our sins. Thank God for that. And then we find not only that it was a planned price, a planned cost, but it was a purifying price, a purifying cross. It was all done by Christ. All done by Christ. And we will find that in verses 21 and 22. Who by Him we believe in God that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit of the unfeigned love of the brethren. I want you to understand the cost paid. It was vicarious. He became sin for us. Even though He knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We might be purified. Purifying cause. Hallelujah. And then remember, not only our condition before Christ, the cost paid by Christ, but remember the day of your conversion to Christ. When you got yourself a, a new master. Remember verse number 22 here. He says, obeying the truth. Obeying a master. You obey your master. Verse number 14. As obedient children. To obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of ram. God wants you to obey the gospel. And to obey the gospel means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To receive Him. To allow Him to have His way with me. Hallelujah. Our conversion to Christ. We have a new master. We have a, a new mindset. And we saw that in verse 22. And we see this right here. Seeing you purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit under unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And we see this area that we love what we did not love. We love the brethren and we did not love the brethren before. We may have liked them because they were good workers. We may have liked them because they didn't cuss and fuss and cause a lot of trouble. But we didn't love being around them. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Right. 
If you do not desire to be around the people of God, then I have a real question about if you know God. There's a loving what we did not love, and there was a loving how we did not love. He says unfeigned. He says pure heart. And he says fervent. Oh, look at those words there. Fervently, pure heart, unfeigned. God says our love is real. Our love is, mm, it's a fire. That is why it's hard. It ought to be hard. And it was hard when they tell the churches, listen, because of this pandemic, you're not supposed to assemble with more than 10 people. You're saying, but I've got to, I want to. There's a burning in me, a yearning in me. It ought to be hard not to be in church. It ought to be. Because you like being around the bread. And so we come from this uh, consecrated memory, a consecrated mind, and we come to this consecrated ministry. And we see in chapter 2 and verse number 1, there's a laying aside of sin. And as we look at that laying aside of sin, uh, we see that there's this laying aside of sins that dealt more with the heart sins before it deals with the hand sins. Or the, the attitude before it deals with the action. It deals with envy. And it deals with malicious uh, spirit, guile, hypocrisy, envy. And then it deals with evil speakings. But it's out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we know that God wants to look at your heart and search your heart and try your heart. And we know that Hebrews uh, 12, verse number 15 shows us this, that the root of bitterness comes before the fruit of defilement. For he says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A consecrated ministry of laying aside sin. When God searches us and tries us and sees a wicked way in us, and He does His examination of us because there's an aspiration to let Him. And He shows us this and there's an a extermination or a, 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 a extradition or something, I guess, I don't know what it would be called. Eradication, I think, is the word I use Thursday night. Getting rid of it, laying it aside, throwing it away. Put it all. When he searches us and shows us, and then what do we do? We lay it aside. If there's not that, you'll never have a consecrated life. You'll never be holy unless you put away the sin. If you, unless you put off the old man. Break off your sin by righteousness. What is he telling Nebuchadnezzar? He says, break off your sin and live for God. Live right. Do right. I think it was Bob Jones Sr. said, do right till the stars fall from the sky. Just do right. We see there's a consecrated ministry of laying aside sin. There's a consecrated ministry of living in the Scripture. And uh, uh, we'll try to get next week, we'll get to loving on the Savior. But these are the consecrated ministries. And we're going to look at living in the Scriptures today. In verse number 2 of chapter 2, he says, As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now let me say that laying aside challenges to give up sin. But let me say verse number 2 tells us to Get in of the Word. Give up sin and get in the Word. And that should be our ministry is to give up sin and get in of the Word. The sincere milk of the Word. I like that. Get in. And uh, he gives us a description of how to get in the Word. As newborn babe. 
It's an exhortation to get in the Word. Just like a, a newborn baby desires milk, you ought to get in the Word just like a newborn baby wants the milk, the sincere milk. Because most newborns are born hungry. You might not believe that, but most of them are born hungry and find themselves uh, looking for nourishment and from their mother's breast and that sincere meal from their mother. Uh, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou hast made me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I am not trying to be crude. I'm trying to be biblical though. God says that the newborn babes want to suck on the Word of God. Be a sucking child. And if you're a newborn baby, you ought to, uh, or if you're a child of God, you ought to desire, just like a baby does, want to uh, grab a hold to and uh, get all the nourishment he can from his mother. And you and I, as children of God, we ought to have a desire, a hunger, to get into the Word of God and get all the nourishment we can from the Word of God. It's, he deals with this thing. Of how to get in the Word. There's a description as newborn babes. Let me say babies find hope from the nourishment. They find health from the nourishment. And they find help from the nourishment that they get from their mother. And the same thing is true. If you get in the Word of God, you will find hope. Remember the Word of thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Psalm 119 and verse 49 tells us. You will find help <coughs> from the Word of God. And you will find help in the Word of God. It will help you. So we find that this thing is, is teaches a description of how we are to get into the Word as newborn babes. Just like a baby would desire milk, we are to desire the Word of God. Then he tells us the details of why we need the word, the, the sincere milk of the word, that we may grow thereby. That we may grow thereby. Now, is it your hope to grow up to be a healthy Christian? Is it your hope to grow up to be a holy Christian? Is it your? Is there help in the Word of God? Do you need the Word of God to be help to grow up to be healthy? And to be holy. Because a healthy Christian is a holy Christian. For he says, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Be ye holy for I am holy. And today I want to look at two requirements that we want to look at if we have, if we hope to expect to grow up to be healthy and holy. And I will see them from verse 3 and verse 2. And I will say there's the first of all, there's a prerequisite of salvation that we see in verse number 3. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. There is a prerequisite of salvation if you ever expect to grow by the Word of God. You cannot grow if you've not been born. So you've never tasted that the Lord is gracious. You will never understand the grace of God that will grow you in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that's why I said it. It says that word there. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And then I see another prerequisite, not just a prerequisite of salvation, but I see there is a purity of the Scriptures and we will get into that this afternoon. The purity of the Scriptures. But here's what I see about the prerequisite of salvation, which is why earlier we read chapter 1, verse number 23, because that goes back to the prerequisite of salvation. You can never grow in grace if you've never tasted grace. Is that not true? If you've never tasted grace, you'll never grow in grace. And verse number 23 of chapter 1 teaches us of this being born again and not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible but by the word of God which liveth and abides forever. This is the consecrated method 
It is a total different idea, than, but it is part of the consecrated ministry, which is living in the Word, but you must go by the consecrated method. And so we would look at today the consecrated method. How to have a consecrated life must come by the consecrated method. It's the prerequisite of salvation. It's required if you're going to grow. And I see two parts of this method. And we see the seed of the Spirit and the sounding forth of the Scriptures. And that's in verse number 23 of chapter 1. Verse 23, Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we're going to look at the seed of the Spirit, and then we're looking, forth at, looking at the sounding forth of the Scriptures. The seed of the Spirit, it's an incorruptible Spirit. The seed of the Spirit is incorruptible. It's the Spirit that sets us apart unto God to do His will and to do His work. Matter of fact, He tells us in chapter 1 and verse number 2 He calls it the sanctification of the Spirit. It is God who places us in to Christ. It is the Spirit of God that moves inside of us. You know that He moves inside of you and lives inside of you. He is the gift of God. He is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal life is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me say this about the Spirit. It is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. He places us positionally in Christ. He makes us positionally holy and empowers us to be practically holy. He's the personal Spirit of Christ. Verse number 11 of chapter 1, matter of fact, tells us He is the Spirit of Christ. Here's what He says. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did diligently signify. The Holy Spirit moving in those prophets. The Spirit of Christ moving in those prophets. Holy men of old spake and they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That Spirit. Now, if any man, Romans 8, verse number 9 says, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This incorruptible seed is the seed of the Spirit. It is incorruptible. It is the Spirit of Christ Himself living inside of you, placed inside of you. And I tell you, you and I better understand. That if you don't have the Spirit of God living inside of you, then you're not God's child. You might say, but I'm God's creation. But I will tell you, you have a damnable destination if you do not have the Spirit of God moving inside of you. You're dead in trespasses and sins. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. He is the personal Spirit of Jesus Christ. He is the powerful Spirit of God. Verse number 5, he talks about, uh, here, here, here's what he says, verse number 5 of chapter 1, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you see that? And then let me tell you what he says over in G. He said, Not unto, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and ever. Amen. It's who keeps us. It's the Spirit of Christ, the power of God that keeps us. It is the one that separated us and sanctified us unto God. It is the one who lives inside of us. And it is the one, he is the one who keeps us till all time, till, till Christ returns. Till the day of Christ. The day of redemption. When the final day comes. He keeps us through the sealing of the Spirit according to Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, chapter verse number 13 and chapter 4 verse uh, number uh, 30.